intriguingly of all, he is also the owner proprietor of two terriers press, <laughs> an experimental fine press in Greenville, South Carolina. You must have, you must have two terriers. We are <laughs> delighted to have him with us to deliver this evening's Carmiol lecture. Please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Right. <laughs> Great. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great. Okay, we have multiple microphones and recording devices, so. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming out here tonight, and a special thanks go to the wonderful staff of Rare Book School. Uh, Philip Mogan and Adam Miller were a great help in arranging everything for me to be here tonight, and it's especially meaningful for me to have been invited to give the 2023 Carmiol <coughs> Lecture in the History of the Book Trades. Thank you, Ken, for all that you do. I'm gonna date myself a little bit by telling you that I first came to Rare Book School in the summer of 1999 as a newly minted librarian and archivist to take Daniel Pitty's EAD class. And we were tagging objects in XML instead of SGML for the first time, if you remember what SGML was. Professionally, this institution has helped to show me how bibliography and book history could be studied deeply taught creatively and researched in innovative ways. And I'm forever grateful to have been a student, a friend, and now a lecturer here. So my last book is about stereotype plates and how their introduction into the printing trades and publishing industry in the United States in the early 19th century presented all sorts of challenges and changes. When I'm asked to explain the arguments of the book, I tell people that I'm not necessarily interested in plates per se or their bibliography but that this is really a book about people. Um, the printers, publishers, type founders, and stereotypers, the authors, the compositors, the booksellers, and the auctioneers, whose professional practice, workload, and livelihoods were all impacted to various degrees by the introduction of this new technology and its resulting disruptions into a rapidly changing industry. But tonight, as this is a lecture on the history of the book trades in America, we do need to talk about books, or at least the plates to those books, and explore a bit about their lives and afterlives within a marketplace of their own for the first time. And also look at the ways in which this new art marketplace and stereotype plates impacts US book history. But before I do all that, I'd like to invite you to consider the deep materiality of print culture in early America and the technological innovations that were being implemented in the printing trades in the first half of the 19th century. In a very short amount of time, the introduction of power presses, the introduction of stereotyping, the introduction of machine-made paper, and the growth and consolidation of local printers into regional and national publishers all presented challenges and opportunities to the existing trade the localized artisan craft practices of which had not fundamentally changed, for the most part, since the earliest days of printing in Europe in the 15th century. All of these innovations that I listed became market ready, at least for some well-capitalized printers and publishers in the 30-year period between 1810 and 1840. The most successful printers amassed capital, some of it in the form of stereotype plates, and secured wider distribution networks for their output allowing them to be rightfully called publishers in the modern sense. If a printer slash publisher made the right choice of title and followed the right business model, investing in stereotype plates could secure a greater market share and provide years of cheap reprints, which we'll see in a minute. If they chose to publish the wrong text, it could tie up significant amount, amounts of capital better used elsewhere. The decisions about when and how to invest in this new technology became crucial to their growth and success. So in Jacob Bigelow's 1816 inaugural address as the Rumford professor at Harvard, he celebrated what he considered the unique inventive achievements of US citizens. They were done, he thought, not with an eye to fame and fortune, but with an inherently American sense of improvement and interest in technological progress. 
Bigelow argues in this essay that the origins, the government, and the national resources of the United States set it apart from other nations and created these unique conditions for its advancement. A new representative democracy, unique in the world, naturally lent itself to new democratic forms of innovation in the mechanical arts. This early articulation of American mechanical exceptionalism closely linked democratic principles with technological improvement. Bigelow's ideological position was not uncommon in the early national period, where the recognition and celebration of uniquely American ways of conduct, from political organization to spelling reform to medicine, architecture, and business, were all commonplace in a new nation attempting to establish itself. And here's my oblig obligatory reference to Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, the champion of agrarianism, also held an enlightenment-based sense of optimism about the progress of science in solving real problems and improving the lives of ordinary people. As the nation's first secretary of state, he reviewed the first US patent applications in the 1790s. As president, he championed the newly formed patent office in 1802 as a symbol of US ingenuity. In Jefferson's view, a Republican government could help encourage and cultivate native talent in the mechanical arts. He wrote to Robert Fultman in 1810, I quote, I'm not afraid of new inventions or improvements, nor bigoted to the practices of our forefathers. Yes, Jefferson was wary of the new republics becoming a nation of manufacturers, but he felt the technological improvements could also alter the quality of life for citizens in interesting, significant, meaningful ways. Let me go back. So, what does this have to do with stereotype plates? The introduction of stereotyping offered printers new options for reprinting, investment, and expansion of their trade. The multiple ways in which printers and publishers understood the significance of this new technology, its potential and its limitations, and how this understanding continued to evolve and change over time is the main purpose of my work. By looking closely at the decision-making processes of the people who worked through these changing times in their respective professions, we can avoid the trap of falling into one standard description of how the introduction of stereotyping and electrotyping played only a singular role in the transformation of the 19th century printing trades. This somewhat simplistic shorthand, which is still found in many of the standard printing and publishing histories, also tends to embrace varying degrees of technological determinism and positivism. Michael Warner, in his wonderful Letters of the Republic, reminds us to guard against granting, granting technology, quote, an ontological status prior to culture, observing that practices of technology are always structural, and their meaningful structure is the dimension of culture. The technological changes that I'm interested in are fully embedded within the cultures of the early US Republic and the artisan-based apprenticeship model of labor found in, the, in, found in the printing trades in the modern West, and also in, in their attendant ideologies. The Enlightenment, the post-Enlightenment, enshrinement of reason and progress, the Protestant work ethic, and the seemingly unlimited potential for human advancement offered by the boundless new American continent brimming over with resources of every kind. But the ways in which these new technologies were deployed were not at all monolithic or straightforward, and nor are these ideologies without inherent contradictions, problematic aspects, and disastrous consequences for those without political or economic influence, such as Native Americans and enslaved and free black citizens. Stereotype plates became physical objects of capital corporeal manifestations of authorship and investment properties, portable and infused with the potential for reproduction and distribution in ways that had not been seen before. So by looking at printing, publishing, and authorship through a materialist lens, focused on the plates that enabled these changes to occur and the people who used them, I think we can better understand the coming industrial age of print in 19th century America. So after a work was stereotyped, its plates were housed in small wooden crates and securely warehoused to be brought out and printed from whenever needed. A work no longer had to be composed anew from standing type when more printed copies were required. For the very first time in the history of the printed book, works of authorship became quite literally material texts. 
They're investments that have the potential for long-term, high-volume use to generate future profit. Books as plates also had the added advantage of mobility. As objects of capital, they could be bought, sold, <coughs> used as collateral, and owned by different publishers after their initial creation. The life cycle and the reproductive potential of many works extended long after their copyright, if there was one, had, had long expired. And so inevitably, a marketplace for used stereotype plates develops. Buying a newly cast set of plates initially cost more than twice the standard composition costs of having a work set up in type. As firms dissolved, changed ownerships, or went bankrupt, plates were liquidated in order to play, pay creditors. Publishers could also simply sell their own plates to raise capital for projects. By mid-century, several options for buying and selling used plates were available to publishers. In addition to the publisher's trade sales, which I will talk about shortly, occasional advertisements for individual sets of plates appear in the newly established trade papers in the 1850s, such as Norton's Literary Gazette and its successor, the American Publishers Circular and Literary Gazette. So for example, an ad announcing the sale of the plates and the copyrights to Charles Follin's German grammar and German reader first appeared in Norton's in January 1852. The same ad appeared monthly in all subsequent issues. The plates remained unsold for almost three years. It appeared for the last time in November 1854 under the new headline, For Sale, Very Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> the last edition of Follin's grammar had been printed from those plates in 1849 by the Boston firm of Philip Sampson and Company. The same firm printed the reader from its set of plates during the 1940s, and it presumably was the seller of, these, of the set. Follin first published uh, the German grammar in 1827 and the German reader in 1831. These works were no longer the only German language textbooks available in the United States in 1852, as they had been when they first appeared. Superseded textbooks, outdated reference works, and older editions of scripture that had been extensively printed from over many years constituted a substantial proportion of the first used plates offered for sale. But even 30 years after being produced, the plates could still be useful in some downgraded segments of the market and eventually they did sell. An edition of Follin's Grammar, printed from these 1827 plates, was published in Boston by James Monroe in 1858, and an edition of the German Reader from the 1831 plates was printed in New York as late as 1867. By far the most uh, effective means of buying and selling used plates in the United States was at the newly organized publishers' trade sales held twice a year in Philadelphia and New York, once a year in Boston, with later sales taking place in Cincinnati, the trade sales offered publishers a chance to sell new and older stock directly to booksellers from across the country. Similar regional booksellers could, in turn, preview and purchase new, title, new titles from multiple publishers at once. By the 1840s, the spring New York trade sale had grown into the major North American sale, a two-week extravaganza attracting booksellers and publishers from across the United States and Canada. Other events at that time included ancillary sales, dinners and banquets, and extensive press coverage, making them old home weeks of sorts for publishers and a self-fulfilling celebration of the importance of the American publishing industry. Auctions of stereotype plates were featured as separate lots in published trade sale catalogs and often with an advertisement in the trade papers. Occasional articles in the trade journals reported on some of the more notable prices realized at the sales. While some sets of plates sold in the $1,000 to $2,000 range, a rough equivalent of their production costs, these are generally anomalies. Most used sets of, of plates sold for much less than the cost of manufacture. The first you know, recorded instance of used sets of stereotype plates offered for sale at the trade sales that I've identified appear in August 1833 in, in New York. Among several lots of plates, including editions of Herodotus and Goldsmith's Vicar of Wakefield, was Mental Treasures, a 130-page octavo compendium of short essays that was stereotyped in Philadelphia in 1826. Unlike the sales of Follin's German Grammar and the German Reader, which took place decades after their first printings, this is a short turnaround time. Uh, 
1826, from the initial creation of the plates to their sale, 1833. Afterward, the plates do not appear again on the market in any later trade sale catalogs, and no new edition seems to have ever been published from them. Mental Treasures had either quickly repaid its publisher the initial investment and any likely opportunities for reprintings, or more likely, it was a forced sale to raise money to pay debts, and the plates may not even have been sold. They just disappear. Stereotype plates as the most expensive single items at the sales were generally held until the final day. The auction houses knew that publishers would be more willing to make larger purchases on new sets of plates if they had a good sales week. There's also a symbolic importance to grouping the majority of sets of plates on the final day of the sale. I won't read this long quote. As US publishers became increasingly celebratory about their contributions to literate American culture, these sales offered fitting conclusions to busy weeks of literary commerce. Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper covered several of the trade sales for its national audience and described the work of publishers and booksellers in a high tone of serious purpose as the honorable and deliberate spread of civilization via literary commerce, even encouraging literary tourism to the sales floors. Okay. So in, on July 15, 1851, Norton's and this is a, a zoom in of their masthead. You could see trade sale catalogs as the center in the, in the whole universe of Norton's literary advertiser. Uh, the, Norton's reported on a Philadelphia trade sale held by a new firm, M. Thomas and Sons, which did a brisk business, apparently to the surprise of the Norton's editorial staff. A highlight of Thomas's first sale was the stock of stereotype plates owned by Thomas Davis a surviving partner of McCarty and Davis, one of the first Philadelphia publishers to commission stereotype plates back in the 1820s. Norton sought fit to list the most important plates sold and their prices. Of particular interest here, in addition to the substantial prices realized for Sargent and Rawl and Bacon, is one of McCarty and Davis's sets of stereotype plates to its collection of Shakespeare, which was first published in 1823 and cast in New York by the type, New York type founder, Jedediah Howe. These plates were among the earliest to arrive in Philadelphia for printing, years before anyone had been casting plates themselves in Philadelphia. McCarty and Davis were later able to persuade Howe to come down from New York and set up his foundry there as Philadelphia's first stereotyper. This set of plates was their first commission and one of their strongest steady, steady sellers, brought out in a jointly published venture with Matthew Carey. From a single setting of type, Howe made two different sets of plates to the work with different orientations, an eight volume duodecimo and then a two volume quarto edition. At some point in the late 1840s, Davis sold one of those two sets to a persistent publishing firm in Boston in his memoir for $1,500 and this set be being the other which he kept until his retirement and which made 1400 very decent return on the investment over time. Stereotype plates uh, from the large firm of Putnam and Company were sold at auction in 1851, and a New York Tribune reporter waxed lyrical on the promise of the wider dissemination of these literary works across the country as a result. What is particularly striking in this passage is its allusion to a form of literary manifest destiny to the potential of the book trades through the sale of plates and American works to either downscale or more regional American publishers to impact citizens' lives in new markets across the Western United States. The life or afterlife of literary property had been extended because of the trade sale format with plates and its method moved capital from owner to owner so that more books could be printed domestically and sent out across the country to white American citizens as they occupied new lands. The publishers and booksellers of the United States, never humble in their self-congratulatory rhetoric, um, were publicly praised in passages like this for their collaborative efforts at the sales. A short list of 11 sets of plates with their prices and the names of their purchasers appeared in Norton's for this sale in the fall of 1851. Some of the works went for fairly high prices, 
Putnam's Homes of American Authors sold for $2,000 to Appleton. Andrew Jackson Downing's Landscape Gardening went for $2,050 to J.C. Riker, including copyright. Four volumes of Goldsmith full, sold for $1,660, and Hawthorne's Mosses from an Old Mass was a bargain, Mance was a bargain at $290, sold to Tickner, Reed, and Fields, and subject to copyright. James T. Fields was surely glad to be able to consolidate the older works of Hawthorne under his imprint, including his copyrights even, so as to be able to eventually bring out a collective edition of Hawthorne's works. From this set of plates, it was reported that Putnam realized about $75,000. As the largest trade sale that was organized by the publishing industry in the United States, March 1854 in New York, that sale occasionally lapses into myth in publishers' memoirs of the time. At the grand banquet held for members of the New York Book Publishers Association during that sale, James T. Fields was called to speak. He chose, as his wont, to read a poem that he had written that day on the auction house floor. This is part of it. It goes on and on and on. <laughs> I won't read it. The idealized conviviality of the trade comes through in these lines, together with Fields' proclivity for making playful puns of his publisher's last names. And plates are mentioned, of course, too. The final stanza promises eternal heavenly reward for the good works done by the members of the association with the promise of that same conviviality in heaven. It was easy to be convivial, maybe, when business was ultimately uniformly good for all and the market strong. A report in Norton's gave the revenues for this sale at about $350,000. Now, conversely, the plates to Herman Melville's Piazza Tales and The Confidence Man were offered up by the firm of Miller and Curtis in the fall 1857 New York trade sale. But the Daily Re Tribune reported in September that, quote, two volumes by Herman Melville were withdrawn. Curtis had agreed to Melville's request and pulled the plates, perhaps hoping that the reorganized firm could still publish from them, or maybe that Melville could eventually purchase them back, part of his author's agreement with the firm. A few, years a few weeks later, Melville wrote to Curtis again with dimmer prospects. He said, quote, I will try to do something about the plates as soon as I can. Meanwhile, if they bother you, sell them without remorse to pot with them and melt them down. In 1857 in the fall, after several unsuccessful books and steadily declining sales, Melville could not afford even the liquidation price of 25% of the costs of his plates to his two most recent books, both of which were still in print and one of which had only been published that year. He couldn't afford to buy them back at a discount. Both the Piazza Tales and the Confidence Man were still being advertised as books for retail sale nationally by booksellers during this time, even while the plates to them went up for auction. In a letter to Curtis later that fall, he clearly did not purchase the plates back, and subsequent correspondence between the two makes no further mention of them. Neither work was ever reprinted from the two sets of original plates. Uh, Melville biographer Herschel Parker speculates that Curtis probably sold them as scrap metal shortly thereafter, not anticipating any reprints. Other sales of plates at that sale were equally disappointing. Twice Married, A Tale of Connecticut Life, with an attached 10% copyright, was sold for just $20 to a single bidder, even though the plates cost $133 to create. Like low auction estimates today, uh, the production cost of a set of plates was frequently listed in the trade sale catalogs as a benchmark indicator of value and an inducement to bid for buyers seeking a bargain. The Tribune sought fit to print a somewhat embarrassing list of works that were sold off for their value as metal alone, all at less than 10% of the cost of production. In summing up the results of this sale, the Tribune reported that, quote, probable that not one of the volumes had paid for itself so that Miller and Curtis were like to be exceeding temperate if their only wine was to be drunk out of the skulls of authors. <laughs> so it may be helpful at this point to look at a set of stereotype plates on the secondhand market uh, through a series of transactions relating to the plates of one work and to trace them through several owners and subsequent reprintings. Solomon Northup's memoir, 12 Years a Slave, 
was jointly published in 1853 by the Auburn New York publishing firm of Derby and Miller and several regional variant um, of, of publishers and businesses. 12 Years a Slave was the first narrative of an enslaved person published by a commercial publishing house. All the previous narratives had come to, come to print under the auspices of the anti-slavery societies or were self-published. Derby and Miller uh, was a general interest publisher of school books, popular histories and literature in upstate New York. That same year, they published the best-selling Fern Leaves from Fanny's Portfolio by the popular author Sarah Payson Willis, Fanny Fern. Northup's work was published simultaneously in England by Samson Lowe, and as set up in type, the London edition matches its American counterpart exactly. I can only conclude that two sets of stereotype plates to the work were made in the United States, one of which was sent to England and published there first to secure the British copyright. Only three years later, which is the slide on the left, its publishers noted the 29,000th American impression. All of these impressions to the work came from the same set of stereotype plates. The plates to 12 Years a Slave were offered up for sale at the spring 1859 New York trade sale, only six years after its first publication, and not by its original publisher, but in a large lot of 42 sets of plates offered by another firm, Campbell and Smith, which had not published an edition of it under its own imprint. These plates presumably sold at the, at the sale in 1859 as an edition of 12 Years a Slave printed from that same set of plates appeared later that year under the New York imprint of C.M. Saxton on the right. Saxton, interestingly, uh, was known primarily, uh, primarily as a publisher of agricultural and horticulture books in the journal The Plow. Saxton presumably saw a bargain at the trade sale for a steady seller about plantation life for his primary agrarian audience, despite the tens of thousands of copies already in circulation in the United States over the previous six years. The next edition of 12 Years a Slave to appear was published just after the Civil War in Philadelphia by Keystone Publishing Company. It too was printed from the same set of plates as the 1853 Auburn and 1859 New York editions. But in this edition, the original two-page editor's preface of 1853, which had appeared in all previous editions and impressions, was replaced by a two-page publisher's preface, so-called, that began, slavery is now one of the institutions of the past. The same set of plates was used to print the book, including the original table of contents, which listed the older and incorrect editor's preface on pages 15 and 16, and not had been corrected to note the new publisher's preface on those same pages. Keystone chose to cast two new plates for the publisher's preface and a new title page in order to note the abolition of slavery in the United States and bring the work up to date, but not to pay to correct the table of contents. One more edition of 12 Years a Slave appeared in the 19th century, published in New York by the International Book Company, cheap reprint publishers, sometime around 1890. It too was printed from the same set of plates as the 1853 first edition and all subsequent editions, and it included the postbellum publisher's preface. But by this time, the copper plate illustrations used in each previous edition had long since worn out and were not included. The list of illustrations on the bottom half of the last page of the table of contents is missing from this edition. Evidence that the plate itself was corrected to excise the list of illustrations and bring the volume up to date. Otherwise, the setting of text is identical down to the misnamed editor's preface on pages 15 and 16, all unchanged from the 1853 edition. And after that, presumably worn down after 40 years of impressions and at least five different owners, the plates and the work itself disappear from the marketplace. So, I'd like to conclude with some thoughts on the impact of stereotyping on the lives of a group of African-American authors and publishers who are able to navigate pathways into print at this time. Sojourner Truth, who was born enslaved in upstate New York, remained illiterate her entire life, 
Yet her life story, in the form of a narrative that was first published in 1850, appeared in several editions and impressions during her lifetime, and its sales helped to sustain her financially for more than 25 years. Truth's success as an author and financial well-being were predicated on her engagement with stereotyping her work as much as, or even more than, the printed carte de visite that she, that she also sold at her many speaking engagements. The first edition of Truth's narrative was published for her on credit in 1850 by an abolitionist printer in Boston, James N. Yarrington, who also published William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. Truth, a free woman since 1826, had little savings and worried about taking on debt, altogether, together with the considerable risk of having a set of plates made to the book that she was unsure at the time would sell. But the plates were made, and after its appearance, Truth worked steadily on the abolitionist lecture circuit, eager to, eager to pay off the printer's bill and to increase her own savings. Three years later, 1853, the first edition was sold out. As a way of financing a new impression, her friend James Boyle purchased the plates from her, holding them in trust until she would need them again. The plates, while still effectively belonging to Truth, remained in the possession of Boyle, whom Truth had known for several decades. Boyle also helped her negotiate her, contra her new contract with Yarrington, the publisher. The second edition was printed in 1853. While the first two uh, editions did not include introductions, the 1855 third edition of Truth's Narrative included a notable one by Harriet Beecher Stowe, and the book continued to sell well, sell well and steadily, affording Truth a steady income for many years. In 1875, when she was very ill, Friends rallied to her home in Battle Creek, Michigan. Boyle gave her back the plates to her narrative, and an 1876 edition was brought out. This edition was expanded to include one volume of her new work, The Book of Life. Throughout this 25-year period, the stereotype plates to her narrative remained Truth's major piece of literary property, a material text that allowed her autonomy and income. The plates and the capital represented in them were first financed on credit to purchase, then lent, then used as a gift at different times in her life by their shared trustees and all to her benefit. Truth sold her book for only 25 cents a copy and preferred to have copies simply bound in paper wrappers, like this one, which is our copy at Furman, which is a very different approach from the standard 75 cents to $1.25 of a cloth-bound narrative sold by the anti-slavery societies. Truth refused to raise the price, believing that a cheap book would circulate more widely than an expensive one. William Wells Brown, the black novelist, editor, lecturer, and historian, also successfully negotiated authorship and the publishing world to his advantage. Born enslaved about 1815 in Kentucky, Brown received some early print training in the printing trades, which we don't have time to get into here. He escaped to freedom in 1834 and lived in the Northeast, working for abolitionist and reform causes and becoming a prolific author. When Brown traveled to England and Ireland in 1849 to lecture as part of the anti-slavery movement and as a chosen delegate to the International Peace Conference in Paris, he carried with him on the ship a second set of stereotype plates to his 1847 narrative. Like Frederick Douglass, four years before him, Brown traveled immediately upon arrival in Liverpool over to Dublin to have an Irish edition of the narrative struck off for sale before the lecture tour. Brown writes in his memoir of his European travel, published in 1853, I think, right after that he got back, that in addition to the stereotype plates in his, in his luggage, he also took with him, quote, an iron collar that had been worn by a female slave on the banks of the Mississippi. Arriving in the customs office in Liverpool, the collar became an object of great interest in the hall, drawing the attention of the customs inspectors and provoking embarrassment in some of the Southerners who arrived on the ship with him. Brown writes, several of my countrymen who were standing by were not a little displeased by answers which I gave to questions on the subject of slavery, but they held their peace. The interest caused by the appearance of the iron collar closed the examination of my luggage. Literary scholars and historians have placed considerable emphasis on the liberating effect that acquiring literacy had on enslaved people and freemen, marking an important milestone in the formation of their identities. For Brown, 
traveling with the stereotype plates to his own narrative, and also with the physical restraints used by his former enslavers, meant that his own personhood and story, contained in both his living body and his stereotype plates, made this a singular journey of testimony and liberation. Jonathan Sunshine writes, quote, the stereotype plates in Brown's traveling case remind us that producing oneself as a free subject in print and in life is embedded within a set of material textual practices, practices that are, as the double meaning of stereotypes suggest, also constitutive in processes of racialization. Brown was intimately connected to the plates to his narrative as both the foundation of selfhood and as a means of independence and liberation. His body and the embodied words of his narrative in those plates constitute forms of witness and authority. And on that journey, the two were inseparable. Like Sojourner Truth's path to print, Brown's stereotype plates represent liberation in the form of economic independence, but they also constitute a greater interconnected path of material narrativity. Brown's successful negotiation of the world of transatlantic publishing afforded him a degree of agency and independence that set him apart from many of his fellow abolitionist speakers. So, um, to sum up, my work examines how printing and publishing worlds of the United States in the 19th century reacted to change. How individuals, businesses, and organizations use new technologies to further their aims, and how the cultures of plates that emerged at this time had broader meanings that rippled out and influenced authorship, popular culture, and everyday life and language through their ultimate products, printed material texts. This new understanding of the role of material texts in many different forms pervades 19th century American culture from the physicality and the ubiquity of the plates themselves to the popular uses of the term stereotyping as a metaphor for the expansiveness and the limitations of rapid technological change. Thank you. Kind of talked out, but I'm happy to field questions. <laughs> oh. Avery has a handheld microphone, so if you put up your hand, he'll come to you, and you can ask your question in such a way that everyone will be able to hear. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, really wonderful talk, Jeffrey. Uh, I have a tiny addendum to it from a student essay. And who was so grateful for him that he brought back the stereotype plates himself yes. and then lent them to Putnam and that allowed Putnam mm -hmm. to re revive his, his company. Yes. You, you write I write a little bit about that in the book too as an example. It's an, yet another sort of author-publisher successful negotiation that the, there are fewer of them too. Washington Irving and Henry Carey do the same sort of thing 20 years before to, to, uh, to, to mutual benefit. Longfellow also, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Putnam, uh, Putnam sold off groups of plates every year at the trade sales. So it, his business was so big, so expansive, he had so many plates that warehousing becomes a problem for those few Harper and Brothers, other, the really huge Appletons, the big publishers in the 19th century. So those, they, they start to itemize and do the cost benefit analysis and decide we're gonna let this segment of, the, of, the, of our business go, get it out onto the market, raise capital, reinvest. Um, other firms were less successful doing that. I think Appleton ended up spiraling downward a little bit later on in the 1850s and 60s and 70s as they started to um, get rid of whole segments of their publishing universe. They got rid of all their British literature at one point in order to raise capital and refocus on American. And it, it bought them enough money to 
continue for about two more years, but then the business model, and they sold off their magazine with the plates and all the titles to it, and that further s s quickened their decline. So there are a lot of different models. I was saying this earlier today. I love the 19th century because it's so messy, both in the technical production, but also in all the, the whole publishing negotiations and the transatlantic aspects and the authorial negotiations and failed examples and everything. Yeah, yeah. sequel of this talk, uh, which is, uh, how did these various uh, kinds of figures in the book world uh, make decisions about the jump to electrotype? Mm. You know, what, mm -hmm. what made it worth making the leap? Mm -hmm. What might lead someone to say, uh, we yeah. don't need to go that direction, we'll stick with the old stereotype? Yeah, and by, by I, I shorthand it, I should have said it at the beginning, when I say stereotype, I really mean stereotyping and electrotyping as just a process, the generating of plates, however you generate it. Um, it becomes sort of ubiquitous by the 1850s or so, and so it just becomes, it's just easier to have to deal with instead of lots of plaster of Paris and, and all that sort of thing. So um, if the main costs were the upfront investment to generate that set of plates for some reason, um, if the publishers could successfully choose the right work at the right time for the right market and be able to afford to do that, then things worked out well. So, but yeah, you, electrotyping really is the, se is the middle to the second half of the 19th century as a process. And I just say stereotyping because it's shorter. But <laughs> the book title had to say that too because people would often think about stereotypes and how stereotyping becomes you know, it becomes initially a, a synonym for copying. Um, Thoreau uses it in his correspondence with Emerson. You know, copy this, copy that. I stereotype the the nat I stereotype nature and the world. You know, and then it becomes more of a metaphor for a kind of a soulless copy as the century goes on, and then finally it comes to be the pejorative term that it, that we all sort of know and think of it today as a as an improper or in, ineffectual copy of something. So the, the language aspect is, is also part of it. Yeah. Right. Could you tell us about instances in which publishers were renting the plates to mm -hmm. publishers in other markets? Mm -hmm. I haven't found a lot of examples of that. I've seen more um, jointly published kind of works where an older established publisher might gives a younger publisher a leg up in the trade or a, a chance to kind of bring someone along maybe and enter into, into a partnership with a jointly published edition. I I've seen more examples of that than, um, I haven't found a contract, a sales contract yet for someone leasing out their plates for one impression for 12 months and then getting them back and that sort of thing. Did Webster do that? Oh, okay, okay. All right, thank you, Terry. The speller. With all his publishers, yeah. Of plates than it was to send a heavy paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question. Thank you again um, for the talk. So you talk about how um, plates, the production of the plates, cost twice as much as the actual setting of the type. Initially. Um, as an example, uh -huh. did publishers keep type setters as staff on hand as a contingency, and mm -hmm. if there was a shift towards? Uh -huh. um, Mm -hmm. of, of typesetters, do you have any sort of testimonies mm -hmm. from, you know, we're living in an, an age of automation now as well, um, any, mm -hmm. any insights yeah. from, from how that workforce responded? Yeah. Compositors were threatened <laughs> by <laughs> the presumably halving of their potential workload in the future. Uh, it didn't play out that way. There are other things happening within the printing trades that were impacting um, the, the decline of the ubiquity of compositors, and they formed some of the first trade unions in America as a result, forming these typographical societies. But it really depends on the publisher. Um, you know, Matthew Carey in Philadelphia got rid of his printers 
and early on by 1805, 1810, and became a publisher, and all his printing was done jobbed out. And he commissioned stereotype plates from New York and then Philadelphia. Harper and Brothers had the, you know, the famous vertically integrated printing shop where they had their compositors and their book binders and their stereotype vault warehouse and chose to, as a business practice, just to create plates from every new work they created starting in the 1830s. So the, the multiple, there are multiple models for this. And I talk a little bit about the trade union aspects, the labor implications of this, but really the, the main changes to compositors were coming from outside labor, um, foreign labor, people who, who are moving around and not completing their, in, their apprenticeships and claiming they had. And so the, the compositors in a city were trying to form these typographical unions to kind of control who got to set type and standardize pricing, seeing all these multiple outside threats to their business and livelihoods. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, a, well, let's see, two, two fifths of the book is about religious publishing in America. Um, the American Bible Society and then Matthew Carey and his Bible plates too. So yeah, Nord is, Nord is wonderful and a resource because he argues accurately that the religious publishing societies that developed in America in the early 19th century were the first mass market publishers in America, uh, the first mass media to, to cover the country with cheap Bibles or New Testaments and then tracts and other, uh, and other texts. The American Bible Society, the American Sunday School Union, um, they eagerly embraced the reproductive potential of printing from plates and started commissioning them from the first. American Bible Society right when it was formed in 1816 and the American Sunday School Union in 1824 when it first formed. They saw the, the businessmen trustees of these organizations quickly saw that investing in plates would be the model for generating 50,000 Bibles of impressions from a set and just continuing that model. So absolutely, it's, it's crucial to this part. Not, not today's talk, but yeah, absolutely. Mass market or religious, did you mean? I'm sorry. Mass market. Mass market. So, so yeah, yeah. You, the concept you focus on today, right? Like, mm -hmm. do you see a trend towards centralization or a different specialization? Or? Well, I, in, in some ways, you know, the, the standard literary publishing history is one of consolidation over the course of the 19th century, right? The J&J the, the, the &J Harpers of the 18 teens that start off as job printers work hard, they amass capital, they build a building, they bring in their other two brothers, and by the 1830s, they have one of the largest publishing houses in New York, 20 year period. They start stereotyping everything, they have their fire in 1853, and they build this ma massive block uh, edifice of a printing, publishing, retail office structure. So it's one of growth and consolidation of markets. So I'm interested in the unsuccessful stories too, uh, very much so. The American Bible Society had horrible pro prospects commissioning sets of placed plates to these New York stereotypers who couldn't deliver or took two years longer than the original contract to deliver and then only delivered half the book. And so you know, different differences between the commercial versus the non-commercial printing universe, but, but um, the market must survive and grow. And so this consolidation happens. But, but yeah, there are plenty of uh, also other examples of that <coughs> too, which we can talk about. Yeah. Let's thank our speaker mm -hmm. once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.